you've ever heard his name, Mufti Zaid, does a lot of work with uh, local masjids, local youth organizations, specifically YM. He's very big over there. And he's a, a frequent uh, khatib throughout the city. And he does <laughs> talks out there and misses and stuff. And it's truly a pleasure and a blessing to have him with us this semester. So without further ado, Mufti Zaid. All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وما بعد. The idea is that there are these misconceptions that usually are voiced at the end of an MSA event or at the end of a talk, and the speaker, in their limited time, tries to go through as many questions as possible. Uh, many a times, the questions that are voiced are very complex, meaning they need to be given their due time, so it's not addressed. So hopefully, inshallah, this uh, six-part halakha series is going to be focused on trying to answer some of these questions, going through these questions, hopefully in a discussion format. I do want immediate feedback in the sense where you are questioning, where you do give me food for thought as well, so it's not just a lecture. A um, couple of the questions I got on my phone, so I'll go through the phone ones first, and then I have a piece of paper. So the first question. What does enjoining good and forbidding evil really mean? Where do we strike the balance between becoming haram police and being accused of being judgmental? All right. So. What do you think it means? Let's start with that. It's a very common phrase, right? Amr bil ma'aruf nahi anil munkar. Forbid evil and do good. Uh, constantly repeated, everybody says it, what does that actually mean? Or what do you think it actually means when it's told to you? Yes. Well, I know one of the ways that you can do it is by acting on things you know are right and mm -hmm. by staying away from things new or wrong. Uh -huh. So that's one of the ways that you can enjoy the good and the good. Okay. Anybody else? So if somebody has ever walked up to you and told you something, uh, either to do something or not to do something, and they said, it's with the intention of forbidding evil and enjoining good. What do you think was the intention behind it? Or what was your impression of that? There's a reason why this is a question instead of a straightforward concept. Why has it become a question? Um, I think many people find it offensive when uh, okay. they're approached. Mm -hmm. Uh, a way to not make it offensive is try saying it in the happiest way possible. Okay. Is it possible to never offend anybody? No. No, right? Why? No, um, in a way, in a way, in our society today, we have become hyper aware of everything, right? We're very hyper aware of criticism. And many a times even well-intentioned critiques are looked at as attacks on our character. Yes or no? Yeah. Is it still possible for somebody to attack your character in the guise of giving a critique? Yes. So, when it comes to enjoining good and forbidding evil, let's start with the very basic. Luqman alayhi salam, when he gave advice to his son, he started with, يَا بُنَيَّ إِنَّهَا إِن تَكُ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِّنْ خَرْدَلٍ فَتَكُنْ فِي صَخْرَةٍ أَوْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ أَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَأْتِ بِهَا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَطِيفٌ خَبِيرٌ Surah Luqman, verse number 16. Right? So, Luqman a.s. before he even tells his son what to do, what not to do, he starts with a simple question. Do you know who Allah is? And this is, I think, the underlying question behind almost every single one of the questions I've received for today, right? It's based on what is our relationship to Allah. So, Luqman salam poses the question to his son, do you know who Allah is? Before I tell you to do anything, before I tell you to worship this all-powerful being, your creator, I want you to understand who Allah is first. If you have no established relationship with Allah, it will be very difficult for you to worship Him. So, let me give you an example. Oh, my beloved son, if you took a small mustard seed and you put it inside of a boulder and this boulder was anywhere in the heavens and earth, Allah would still be able to bring it to you without any difficulty whatsoever. That's the example He gives. Now, obviously today, 
we understand there are far more smaller things than a mustard seed. Things that are very, that are, you know, naked to the eye can only be seen through a microscope or something far more powerful, right? So, if something like that was in a boulder, and this boulder was anywhere in the heavens and earth, according to Luqman salam, it could have meant whatever skies were apparent, and whatever earth he can see. But according to our understanding, we know that earth is just one planet, and one planet in a solar system, a solar system part of a galaxy, our galaxy is part of other billions and billions of other galaxies, and a universe that is constantly expanding. So, this very small insignificant thing anywhere in the universe Allah will be able to bring it to you. So Luqman salam poses this question and he says, once you realize who Allah is, anything you try to do for Allah will be easy. So then he gives them advice and he says, Ya Bunayya aqim salah Oh my beloved son, establish prayer. Establish prayer. Connect yourself to Allah. Allah is the only constant in this entire universe of chaos. If you connect yourself to Allah, you will always be stable. If you connect everything to Allah, you will always be stable. The one way you maintain a connection to Allah is by praying five times a day. There's a reason why the five times prayers are spread out throughout the entire day. Allah knew that in the year, uh, you know, in the 21st century, people will be working and, you know, four to five will be rush hour. And during the winter time, people will be stuck in the trains for Asr and they might miss their Asr. Allah in His infinite wisdom could have said, okay, all of you can, you can pray when you get home at the end of the day. You don't have to wake up early morning and you don't have to pray Fajr you know, when it's still dark. You don't have to wake up an hour earlier before work. You don't have to take uh, an extra long uh, lunch break to pray Dhuhr. Or you don't have to cut into your lunch break to pray Dhuhr. Um, you don't have to rush home to pray Maghrib. Right? Allah in His infinite wisdom and mercy saw that these would be issues for us. But there's a reason why the prayers are still spread out. In the morning, before we come to school, when we pray Fajr, we are reminding ourselves of the fact that when we go and study, the only way we will be able to benefit ourselves and enrich our lives through the knowledge that we are learning is if Allah has mercy upon us. There are so many people, our age, our generation, who don't have the luxury of even coming to a college. Forget any other elite private college, like a normal four-year city, state college, or any type of educational institution. Circumstances, whatever, life prevents people from doing some of the things that we take for granted. So, before you come to college and you are praying Fajr at home, you're reminding yourself of the fact that, Oh Allah, this is a blessing that you have gifted me. When people go out for work and they work 9 to 5 jobs making minimum wage and they're trying to make ends meet by, you know, they're trying to save every single penny so that they can put food on the table, where is that coming from? Right? Allah is the one telling them that, listen, even if you work 9 to 5, and if you get many minimum wage, you will get whatever is stipulated for you. If you work 20 hour days, if you work overtime, if you are killing yourself at your job, you will still get whatever I had stipulated for you. Nothing more, nothing less. And then, Luqman salam tells his son, وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنْحَا الْمُنْكَرِ Tell people to do good, and tell people not to do wrong. What's the connection? When you establish a connection with Allah, we are by nature supposed to be altruistic. We are by nature supposed to care about the people around us. Luqman salam is telling his son that you have established yourself to Allah, try to do the same to the people around you. A person who is not praying, somebody else who is not close to the faith, bring them closer. Somebody who is disobeying Allah, advise them not to do wrong. We'll get into the details about what does it actually mean to enjoin and to forbid. Okay. وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنْحَانِ الْمُنْكَ Advise people to do good. Advise people not to do wrong. And وَصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَكَ And this is where I'll end with Luqman salam's advice. He carries on for two more verses. وَصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَكَ And have patience on whatever afflicts you. Why mention patience there? Because it's human nature not to listen. We don't like being told when we are doing something wrong. Rather, we will dig in our heels and we will make excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse trying to justify what we are doing. Right? When you, with the best of intentions, with the best of words, with the best of everything, try to tell somebody to stop doing something, what is the overwhelming reaction? 
What's the overwhelming reaction? Well, look at you. The or don't judge me. Yeah. Who are you to tell me? Was there anybody on the face of this earth more well behaved than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Or somebody who, who used the best words more than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? No, but when he told the people of Makkah that worship Allah, and this is despite the fact he had a spotless reputation, what were their reactions? No, you're a liar. No, you're a poet. You're a magician. We don't want to listen to you. They dug in their heels. It's human nature. So, enjoining good, forbidding evil. It's how we are supposed to show care towards our fellow human beings, fellow Muslim brothers and sisters. Even though the word Amr, Ta'muruna, Amr literally means to give a command, there's a spectrum of it, which also includes giving advice. We take it very literally and we mean it to mean pray. You have to pray. We don't take it to mean let's go pray. That is also enjoining good. When we say forbidding evil, what's our immediate thought? Don't. Right? No. You can't. Haram. Ha, you know, like we pronounce the ha and everything. Haram, right? And then, you know, they have what they call the haram gun, right? You know, like haram, 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 right? Like you go to a store, like, you know, they're putting price tags on, on boxes, right? Haram, haram, haram. It's like that. Some people carry, you know, they just walk around and they label everything haram. We'll get to that. There's a question about halal and haram. So, enjoining good, forbidding evil has a spectrum. It means advising. It means doing it in a way which is the best. And you know what's the most crucial part of giving advice? Knowing if you are the right person to give the advice. Udru ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawidatil hasana. Call to the path of your Rabb with wisdom and good advice. What comes first? Wisdom. Sometimes we're not the best people for the job. And that's very hard for us to swallow, right? Our ego tells us no. Just because I wear hijab or I have a very big beard or I am the MSA president, you know, no offense, but just because I am in an apparent position of leadership or I am seen to be good by other people, I am the best person to give advice. Not necessarily. Yes? So but how do you know, like, like flip that around, how do you know like, if it's not your responsibility to give our default, our default should always be it is my responsibility. But part of that responsibility is to also recognize whether or not you are the best person to advise. What happens if you're afraid like this person, like, 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 like if, you're, if you're afraid this person is just going to like do something wrong uh -huh. or whatever, you want to like do your best to stop them, you don't want to just leave it all for somebody else to take care of it, right? So like how do you... Yeah, because that sort of mentality is very... Damaging, right? Somebody else will do it so nobody else ends up doing it. Use your best judgment. It's a rock, it's, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Say it's somebody who doesn't like you, then what? It's going to be counterproductive, right? But you do know that you should say something. You could talk to somebody else to help. Yeah, help some, get somebody else to talk to them. What do you, what do, you do after? Now you, you've said it and they've gotten offended. What do you do after? Back off. Back off. Right. right? But there are always ways to show people that you care about them. If you want somebody to come, this is just one example I'm giving, but flip it to any other scenario. If you want somebody to do good, or if you want people to do good, try not to reach out to them only because of that. That your contact with another Muslim at Hunter is only because you want them to come to an MSA event. Try to speak to them when it's not related to anything MSA. That's how they'll know that you actually care about them. That's how they'll know that you actually want them to benefit other than what is at the MSA. Make sense? People pick up on it. The only time that you are reaching out to them is when there's an MSA event coming up and you want them to share the Facebook page the Facebook event on their page, right? That's the only time you talk to them. Or you want them to come fill up a room and you say there's free food, right? 
But during the entire semester, you really ignore them in the corridors. You don't speak to them, you don't give them salam, you don't say, hey, how are you, let's go grab a bite to eat, or how's everything, let's go study together, nothing like that. Our doing good a lot of times is for selfish reasons. And we don't like to think of it as that, but it's true. That is true. Now, where do you strike a balance? To the person who thinks everything is halal, even one thing haram is too much. Does that make sense? To the person who thinks everything is halal, for them even one thing haram is too much. So, you're haram police to somebody. You're gonna end up being a haram police to somebody. Brother, maybe you shouldn't drink. Who are you to judge me? Allah didn't say this is haram. He mentions wine in the Quran. This is jack. There's no jack, There's no jack mentioned in the Quran. Right. Can people ask you questions like that? Yeah, they could. Hey, I've heard people say that. That's why I'm saying it. So for people who are very, very, very adamant that what they are doing is right, despite all other indications, it's best to just leave it at the first point of advice, which is, I think you shouldn't do this. If they react negatively, you just back off. To the person who is hyper aware of everything that is told to them, one piece of advice is going to be considered judgmental. What's the first thing somebody might say to you if you tell them, don't do this? No, no, that might be a reaction. That might be a reaction. But what's the first thing they might say? Why? And I'm looking for a specific sentence. No. Only Allah can judge me. Only Allah can judge me. You don't know what's behind my intentions. Right? You don't know what's behind my intentions. That's right. But... Allah is going to judge a person based on their intentions. We perceive the world based on what? What is apparent? If you see somebody doing something wrong, am I supposed to think of anything else other than what you're doing? Yes, there is a concept of making excuses for your brothers and sisters. And we should, unless it's blatantly obvious. Unless it's blatantly obvious. For example, if there's a, there's a case of sexual abuse in the community... You're not going to make 70 excuses for that. You're not even going to make one excuse for that. You shouldn't. Because it's to do with the rights of somebody else. And you have no authority to come in and say, you know, maybe it's a misunderstanding. No, it's not a misunderstanding. But when it's with small things, then make 70 excuses. Don't jump to the conclusion that that person is doing something wrong with the intention of doing wrong. Maybe they don't know. Every person's exposure to Islam is different. We might be born into Muslim families, but all of our experiences growing up with Islam is very different. Very different. It's based on our family, it's based on our level of practice in the home, it's based on our masjid, it's based on our Saturday Sunday school, it's based on our circle of friends, it's based on uh, our high school, middle school, it's based on MSA, it's based on how well, you know, how educated we are regarding, to, regarding our faith. All of that put together really, really shapes a person's perception of deen. They probably just don't know. Right? Probably can't know. So when a person says, only Allah can judge me, what is the implication of it? And it's very frightening. Because they are saying that Allah is going to judge me and He's going to say I'm okay. That's a very bold statement to say. Right? Rather not push it to the extent where somebody says something like that, you rather just leave it. But at the core, you're going to be a haram police to somebody. You're going to be too judgmental to somebody. Even if you try your best to walk the middle path. Make sense? Understand that a lot of these questions are ongoing discussions. This is just us trying to give a little, be a little bit of time to every single one of them. Any... any uh, ending questions with this? Last minute comments, concerns? 
doesn't necessarily mean to command although it literally means to command it includes advice give people advice to do good so would you acting on something correctly or saying maybe something wrong that would, that would be well that's with regard to yourself amr bil ma'ruf nahi anil munkar is a public service if it's done properly must be you doing it to somebody else yes it be you acting on it yourself because you when you are telling yourself then yes you are in a way telling yourself to do good telling yourself to stay away from wrong but when the phrase comes about it usually means what you do to others could you would that would be considered that yes absolutely okay. absolutely so you could do that to all those things yes somebody have the hand up here no okay next question when we do a good deed do we do it because it's a good thing to do or because of the rewards parentheses brownie points it brings what if wanting the latter make me a selfish person no this is the mercy of allah that he understands human behavior he created us in a way where we seek validation where we want to know that whatever we are doing is ultimately going to be worth something even if it's not readily apparent in front of us it takes immense patience to constantly to to constantly do good throughout your entire life and to constantly stay away from the vices of this world which society around you is indulging in simply because we don't see the rewards in front of us immediately right ever had one bar of your wifi go down what happened irritation level spiked right why is it downloading faster what is wrong with this you know that circle of death that happens on youtube right just going and going it triggers rage right why because we've become a society that loves instant gratification right that i will order something here and by the time i take by the time i take my car around it has to be ready instant gratification if i want to buy something i will go online to amazon and i will look for the fastest delivery date so i can get it immediately right instant gratification we do something we want to see the benefits of it immediately contrast that to anything we do for allah do we get the benefits of it immediately or at least something tangible physical in front of us no right we prayed maghrib after maghrib you didn't have your professor come in and say you know this semester you don't have to show up for lab you'll still get an a even though that's like every student's number one dua probably right don't show up to class don't study the entire semester come to exam write a couple of sentences and you get an a what does it happen a lot of people pray for uh relief from financial problems they have debts they have numerous things to take care of they make dua when they get out of their house or when they get out of the masjid a, a, a check does not magically appear from heavens the system of allah doesn't work like that every single time we pray every single time we stay away from wrong we do so because we believe in the promise of allah we believe in the promise of allah we believe in the fact that when our eyes close and we are standing in front of allah Allah will reward us in a way that is just and Allah will be merciful and he will overlook any of our faults as long as we are contrite about it in this world. That's our idea when we worship Allah, right? We know we're not getting instantly rewarded. We know that all of it is just getting recorded and we will see the fruits of our labors on the day of judgment, which is why it is so hard to consistently do good. because we don't see the immediate rewards and benefits in front of us yes or no right we don't see it immediately in front of us so allah tells us okay at the very least when you are trying to do something good i want to motivate you and this is your motivation this is how you will be rewarded you do this this is how much reward will be written down for you we believe in that so we do it And it is the mercy of Allah that he allows us to be that selfish. 
Yes, it is inherently selfish that when we pray, when we do anything good, we do it with the intention of reward, that Allah will write it down in my book of deeds, and it will be a plus point for me on the Day of Judgment. But again, if you think or subscribe to the model that Allah will reward you justly, Allah allows you to be selfish. He wants you to do the action for him, but the reward is for you. The reward is for you. So it does not make you selfish. That is the basic level of sincerity. A higher level of sincerity is to worship Allah because you want to please Him without the expectation of any rewards. To basically do good without expecting any in return because you know you are pleasing Allah. And that is a level that very few attain. And it's not a necessary thing to attain. Allah is perfectly content with just rewarding us as long as we do the acts of worship for Him. Any questions regarding that? Yes. Good things don't require intentions. Next question. How can we as Muslims reach out more to show the world the Muslims are good people and not how the media portrays us to be? Just be yourself and do what Allah told you to do. That's the best approach. Realistically speaking, even if you had all the resources at your disposal there will always be people who will choose to see things negatively regardless yes or no yes. it's a fact right haters are gonna hate no matter what you do if somebody wishes to find flaws they will find flaws right if somebody chooses to ignore the overwhelming good of something and choose to, chooses to focus on one fault, is there anything you can do about that? No. It's up to us as a community, as individuals, as believers of our faith that we try at every given moment to be the best example possible. We automatically are going to do so when we try to follow footsteps of our Prophet. Ideal model for a particular reason. If our words, if our actions are actually what the Prophet told us to do, there would be no room for criticism or at least any valid, legitimate criticism. And we have to stop taking this mentality where we feel that if we can just do a little more, everything will be all right. Hard to believe, but no, it's not possible. It's not possible. If this world was meant to be a utopia, it would have been a utopia. But the fact of the matter is that there is strife in this world, right, to violent degrees. There is disagreement, there is disharmony, there is dysfunction. A lot of things wrong in the world, right? That jars with the beauty that we see around us every day. If Allah chose, He could have made this world perfect. But if this world was perfect, what will be the difference between this and the next life? The goal of living through life in this world is to get through the dysfunction as much as possible, as well as possible. If you are always going to beat yourself over the fact that you can't convince every right winger that your Quran is not a book of violence and you're getting yourself into arguments over YouTube, on Facebook, and you're trying to argue with people who are just commenting over and over the same straw man arguments, you're going to drive yourself insane. Even with all of the resources available, it is not possible for all of us to change the mind of the entire world. The best way to affect change 
is to do so immediately around us. Every single one of you, wherever you go, you are supposed to be, we are supposed to be a beacon of light. We are supposed to be a candle that gives light to the people around us in every way possible. You are supposed to be a source of comfort. You are supposed to be a source of good. People are supposed to look at you and say, this is what a Muslim actually is. We don't do good because we want to please other people. The side effect of doing good, the byproduct of doing good for Allah is that people notice. You do your best, you do your best, you try your utmost and you leave everything up to Allah. Guidance is in the hands of Allah. And it's very frustrating, I'm not saying it's not frustrating. It seems as if that we are always taking one step forward and a tragedy happens and then we as a community collectively takes two steps back. Right? That is the same process every single time where we collectively apologize, we collectively condemn, we collectively disassociate ourselves, we collectively do everything. We collectively have to prove our humanity over and over and over and over. I care. I am a human being. It's frustrating. It's emotionally exhausting to do so all the time. But it's a reality. It's a reality. What you can do is from one incident to the next, is from, from point A to point B, you try your best to show the people who you are interacting with every single day what Islam is, what a Muslim is supposed to be like. That's how you start change. That's how you affect change. That's how you change minds of people. Be generous. Be charitable. Be happy. Be a good person. Simple. And people will automatically notice the beauty of the. Can everything in Islam? Any questions, comments regarding that? Yeah. Um, so at one point, at one, at what point does <coughs> we as individuals, somebody belong to us, like Islamophobia, and a lot of people have this idea that because we have to get above and beyond the standard, um, just forgive and forget. But at one point, does that become like a danger? Forgive and forget, turn the other cheek does not mean that you become a doormat. Right? If your dignity, integrity as a human being is being violated, then you stand up for it. Allah didn't say that you have to take it laying down. The Prophet didn't say that you have to take it laying down. I think it's kind of, I'm not saying you think like this, but anybody who subscribe to, subscribes to this idea and naively thinks that by letting people walk over you, that people are going to respect you, I think it's a foolish notion. It's a foolish notion. Right? When you are able to, you try to forgive. You try to be merciful. Right? But there's nothing wrong against saying that this is my right. Can everything in Islam be categorized into good and evil or halal and haram? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yes. Can everything be classified as halal, haram, good, and evil? No. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Whoever said yes, why? Whoever said no, why? I I say I say it's it's yes, but as human beings, we're unable to classify everything. Okay. Okay. So. I mean, I said no because. Uh, then isn't there a hadith or a prophet says one Imam number forty two a hadith where he says that there are great matters? And if you stay away from the great matters what do you say? Mm. Okay. Well the great matters are great thoughts. Mm. I I think there's um I think that there's uh there is a uh, different well it's question I agree with it, right? That there's a lot of Okay. Yeah, um I think that even though times have changed, it's still possible uh -huh. to follow it. Uh -huh. Like um, 
one of the biggest things these days is like you trying to find a wife, right? And you have to talk to her somehow. So even though both of you, even though like you can text, you can Facebook message, mm-hmm. you're a third party, you can make a group message. Uh-huh. You know, I, I think that that's one example to see that you can make it a lot of it out. The question specifically refers to categories. Are there categories other than good and evil or halal and halal? Um, I think it's more like there is a category. It's just like I think what he was trying to say was we just don't know what it is that's halal and what's haram like besides of whatever knowledge we have about Islam. Okay. So, um, and when the Prophet was on say just to stay away from, he didn't say to like, like try to find out about the great marriage. Yeah. Just stay away from it. Completely. Okay. So that's not even like a... Okay. Isn't uh, the whole concept of difference of opinion, like, mm. Mm. Yeah, like mm. a great marriage, like, that's not necessary. Okay. Okay. Right off the bat, there are few explicitly good, explicitly wrong things mentioned in the Quran and Hadith, relatively speak, comparatively speaking, right? If you actually make a list of things that are unambiguously no room for argument good, no room for argument wrong, if you count them up, there are very few in both categories. Everything else is in the middle, right? What we would call gray areas. But more than that, actions are just sometimes neutral doesn't have to have a religious value to it, doesn't have to have a religious sin behind it, right? Pulling the curtains down is an action, right? Is it good or evil? It affects, is, it, it depends on your intention. So if your intention is to what? Wake up your classmates who are sleeping in class but they're in class, but you're waking them up from their sleep, but your intention is good, but they don't look at it that way because they're sleeping. Is it good or bad? Huh? No, but the action itself, I'm, that's what I'm talking about. The action itself. It's a neutral action. No, my point is that if we categorize everything into halal and haram, or good and wrong, we are sort of ignoring the entire gray area in the middle. I'm just talking about halal and haram. Yeah. So halal and haram or good and wrong are on spectrums. They're on the opposite side of the spectrums. Everything in the middle either leans towards one side or the other. The closer it is, the better it is. The closer to it is to that side, the more wrong it is. Does that make sense? Wait, so, so, so we're doing the direct like, thing that anything halal is good and anything haram is bad? Yeah, so there are certain things that we cannot argue against, right? So we're not talking about those. And there are certain things we cannot argue for because Allah has made it explicitly clear. So we're not talking about those either. We're talking about neutral actions. Yeah, but even the neutral action okay. is permissible. There is permissible. There is light. There is dislike. There is okay. etiquette. Like, for example, etiquettes. Etiquettes are neither good nor bad. If you do, it's good. If you don't do it, there's nothing wrong with it. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay. Like, respecting different cultures. Okay. Respecting the parents of different cultures. And Allah just says respect your parents. Okay. So he said, beyond the few direct commands that don't yell at them, or take over time. Yeah. Does it tell us exactly what respect in that context means? True, true. You can, you can take a few direct examples, and anything that relates to respect can lean towards that. Yeah, so like, you're more like what is right in one culture might be disrespectful. Exactly. So it's relative, but the overall running theme is still respect. Right. But, um, I mean, what I understood from Allah and Haram before was, or at least, is that, like, it's like, Everything is permissible unless it's around. Yeah. Isn't that isn't isn't it that like the hard stop comes? That's to that's the where that's where the pitfall of the haram police comes in. Because things are permissible by default, unless otherwise stated. If it's explicitly stated, then we can say it's haram. 
if it's implicitly stated or ambiguously stated, what do we say? It's a gray matter, probably best to stay away from it. Right? There are different terms for it. Makru, for example, disliked. But there's a reason why those terms exist. Because we cannot unequivocally say that it is haram. Does that make sense? But because there's something that sort of pushes it towards that side of the spectrum, we try our best to stay away from it. The question was a good. Um, anything to add to this? It's supposed to be a discussion. I'm talking the most to. Any questions? Comments? No? Okay. The next couple of questions, I sort of left them for the end because they're all grouped together in a way. So I'll read the questions to you. And then we'll go through some of the details. So the first question, why do bad things happen in the world? Why do bad things happen in the world? Why can't people who just do good deeds go to heaven? Why is believing in and worshipping God a condition for that? Question number three. Perhaps a non-Muslim is an overall decent human being, meaning they take care of their family, give in charity, uphold good values, etc. But for one reason or the other does not believe in Allah or perhaps religion in general. So as far as they are concerned, they don't deem the belief in Allah as quote-unquote necessary. Why is it necessary? Perhaps the idea of God or religion doesn't cross their mind too often. What general approaches would you suggest in engaging such a person about the importance of the belief in Allah? Question number four. Why is it that people who aren't Muslims who do good deeds and who do good deeds will go to Jahannam? How is that quote-unquote good? Question number five. Why do bad things happen to a child who doesn't even know the difference between good and evil? What was the running theme between all the questions? Or the common things between all these questions? Yes. Why do good and bad things happen? What's the most easiest answer to that? God's will. Or it's a test, right? Oh, well, let's go through some uh, points that I sort of wrote down. And hopefully it'll uh, uh, make us think a little. So, according to our understanding, everything in this entire cosmos is a creation of Allah. Which includes the concepts of good and wrong good and evil. However, how do we usually attribute good to Allah? If anything, if anything good happens to you, what do you say? Alhamdulillah. So you're attributing praise directly to Allah. If anything bad happens to you, what do you say? Inna lillah, subhanallah, astaghfirullah. But you are seeking refuge in Allah who created what had happened to you. As a matter of etiquette, and this is something we find in Ibrahim salam in the Quran, we do not directly attribute anything wrong to Allah. Ibrahim salam, in a series of statements that he made in the Quran, he said that when I fall sick, Allah is the one who cures me. He didn't say when Allah makes me sick, then I am cured by Allah as well. Now, take religion out of the equation for a second. What is the natural state of a human being? Or the natural impulse of a human being? Take, take socialization out of it. Take social constructs out of it. Take impulses, impetus, whatever around us, out of the equation. Everything. What do you think is the base impulse of a human being? Survival. Okay. But in terms of actions, are they more, are we as a species more inclined to do good or wrong? Good. Wrong. You, somebody said? We do it if it's benefit to us. We take advantage of others. Okay, so 
do we find examples of everything that you guys said? You said wrong, you said good, you said we do good if it benefits us. Like if there's something for us in return. Do we find examples of everything that you said in other creations around us? There are examples of both. But if a human being who hasn't been taught to hate, who hasn't been taught racism, who hasn't been taught to think about other ethnicities or other people of color or groups or communities as something lower than themselves, would they automatically hate them? No. What does that mean? That hate is taught. Hate is taught. Our nature, by virtue of the fact that we have fitrah, our fitrah is what? That we acknowledge the fact that Allah is our creator. The nature that Allah has created within us is overwhelmingly good. Leans towards good. Which is why when you do good, you feel good about yourself. Because it is in accordance to your own nature. When you do something wrong, unless you have been radically conditioned, or to the extent where you don't know what is right and wrong, you will feel no different. Make sense? Have you ever done anything wrong? And again, take sin out of the equation. Let's not look at it as sin. Think of it as something wrong in terms of social construct. What society tells us is wrong. If you had done it, or if you did a particular action like that, do you feel wrong or do you feel a little guilt in your conscience? Why? Well, it could be because you're thinking about what others are thinking about you. Okay. Because but why do you have guilt? Guilt is something internal. No one can see that. But you still have it. Human okay. nature. Human nature, but what, okay, what does that have to do with human nature? Um, like if you look at human people, like they hate people or whatever, they still convince themselves that they're something good. They're such a is it possible to do wrong without convincing yourself that you are doing something right? No, it goes against your very nature. It goes against your very nature. Now, bring sin into the equation. Why do we feel guilty when we commit sin? Prophet said in a hadith that if the one way to gauge whether or not you are committing a sin is number one, see if it's hitting your conscience. If your conscience is trying to tell you something, more or less you are trying to do something that is not supposed to be done. Number two, that particular action, you wouldn't want people to find out about it. You wouldn't want people to find out about it. That's one way of looking at it. So, the nature that Allah has created within us, is overwhelmingly good. So whenever we do good, we feel good about ourselves and we are always inclined towards good. How is good defined by relationship with Allah? In other words, how does Allah view good and Allah view evil? According to the Quran. Yes. Okay, so... Okay, so Allah says good. Allah says do good. How do we sort of figure out what is good and what is wrong? You don't really know until Allah tells you, which is why revelation plays such a crucial role. It tells us that these are the boundaries, these are the things you shouldn't do, these are the things that you should do. Right? So, at the core of it, anything a person does good, is pleasing to Allah. Anything that is pleasing to Allah by definition is good. Anything that is pleasing to Allah is by definition good. Because Allah would not like anything that is displeasing or Allah would not like anything that is wrong. Consequently, anything that is pleasing to Allah is beneficial for us even if we do not see it at first sight. What does that mean? Sometimes you might not see the benefit of doing a particular action. Right? Or we don't understand the underlying reasons 
uh, behind it. We don't understand the reasons behind it. Does that automatically disqualify it from being good? Right? No. So, by order of process, anything that is pleasing to Allah by definition, because it is pleasing to Allah is good. Anything that is good will be still considered good even if we don't understand the rationale behind it. Make sense so far? Yeah. On the other hand, anything that is displeasing to Allah can be categorized as wrong. Consequently, anything that is wrong can be considered to be harmful for human beings, even if we don't understand the rationale behind it. There are many things that we are told to stay away from. Right? There are certain things that we shouldn't do. Things that are not explicitly explained in the Quran. Why is... Why is pork not permissible for a Muslim to consume? Does the Quran say it's a nasty animal? No. So where do we get the reason for? Science. science. But science can also say that if you cook it properly and if you do all of that and if it's raised humanely and all of that, it should be good. Why isn't, why isn't it still good? Allah told us to. There is no reason for it in the Quran. Blood. Blood is considered to be an, uh, an impure thing mentioned in the Quran. What's the reason behind it? There's no reason. There are many things that we subscribe to without understanding the rationale behind it. What is the immediate benefit of you praying? In terms of reward, in terms of worship. Okay. But can you find a rationale behind every single action that we are told to do? No. No. But we still continue to do it, right? Which means what? Connected to the fact that we have uh, faith in the promise of Allah, we also have faith in the fact that if Allah told us to do something, we do it because even if we don't understand the significance, the rationale behind a particular action, Allah in His infinite wisdom and mercy knows what is best for us as a species. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now, good and evil is determined for Muslims through what? Allah and His Messenger. Allah and His Messenger. Okay, so that's the function of revelation. That Allah does not leave us blinded. Allah tells us what to do, what not to do. So, is something considered good? When we say a particular action is good, do we say it is good because it is good in and of itself? We wouldn't know, so you would have to say it's good we'll both. because someone else. Huh? Both. If you say it's good in and of itself, aren't you holding a law to a standard? I think like, like it's good, you give two reasons why it's good, because Osman Tal said it's good and because it's human nature, like, but you don't know it's good. Like, okay, so we've established the fact that anything that is pleasing to Allah by default will be good. Yeah. But if you look at just any random action and you consider it to be good, I give you a bottle of water, right? Is that action good considered, is that action considered by me good because giving you this bottle of water is good in and of itself or because Allah thinks it's good? Which one? I think both. If you say both, if I say that giving you a bottle of water is good in and of itself, does that mean, it means that I am holding Allah to the standard of considering this action good and you are restricting Allah. It's a theological debate, but the reason why I'm mentioning this is how do we determine what is good? Anybody read the Socratic Dialogues? I can't because it's subjective. What, Socratic Dialogues? No, I mean, no, I'm talking about the good and bad because you okay. said something like it can't be a perfect good. Okay, so we'll get to that. Anybody read the Socratic Dialogues? No? Like, if you were to give him a water bottle, the immediate 
question that comes to my head is, now that we are Muslim and so we love for your brother, we love for yourself, mm-hmm. that would be like an inspiration for you to... But all of that comes through what? Revelation. All that comes because of, like, the only reason, the only, the only way we are able to sort of uh, rationalize why we do what we do is because of revelation. You mentioned, like, the Prophet ﷺ talked about charity and he talked about giving water and all of that. All of that is through revelation, right? So, take revelation out of the equation. How is good considered good? Socratic dialogues, Euthyphro, there's this whole thing about, there's this whole debate of why is something considered good? Is it good because that action in and of itself is good or is it good because something else externally considers it to be good? Because you think it is. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel good. But wrong things make you feel good. Does it make it good? So we can't be an indicator. We're biased. We're biased, right? We're biased. Which is why revelation is necessary. You had your hand up. I'll say it's good just because someone said so. Yeah. No, that is the point of origin for anything that we consider to be virtuous for anything that we consider to be virtuous that is the point of origin Allah told us it is virtuous then we have all these rationals about why it is considered virtuous Allah rewards it or whatever is mentioned in the Quran whatever is mentioned in the hadith sometimes a particular action for no reason might be considered wrong even though apparently we cannot find any reason behind it yes Allah is merciful that even if you don't have an intention, He will still reward you. It's part of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that Iman, a person's belief is supposed to be visualized like the trunk of a tree. Which means that it has very deep roots and it has a lot of branches. So, the branches of Iman are over 70. The highest deed a person can do by virtue of their faith in Allah is to say La ilaha illallah is to testify in the oneness of Allah comparatively the lowest thing a person can do is remove something harmful from the road to remove something harmful from the road so we do that all the time without actually intending we'll kick a bottle to the side right we don't exactly intend for it to be like a good deed or we don't you know say oh Allah I'm doing a good deed we do it and Allah rewards us. Right? So, the way we are supposed to gauge if something is right to do or wrong to do is what Allah tells us. Because our intellect and our logic will take us to a certain extent. There are three stages of knowledge. The first stage of knowledge is what we acquire through our five senses. You see the light. You can't stare at it for too long because your eyes start hurting. If I touch this, if I touch the table, I can feel that it is solid. I can hear the sound of it. And all of that information is giving me knowledge. Now, go to the second one. The second stage of knowledge is what you do with all the information put together. If a kettle, if a teapot is on the stove and it's boiling water inside, how do you know that it is hot? Experience. Experience, but sort of indicators like steam, right? The fire is touching the metal, so you automatically input the information and you come up with equals to hot. But a child who also has five senses, who also can see the steam, who also can see the kettle, who also can see the fire, can they put all that information put can they put all that information together and come up with the conclusion that it is hot? No. So, five senses are the beginning and then we as we grow older gather all the information together and we come to certain conclusions. That's the second stage. But no matter how intelligent we are, we hit a we hit a glass ceiling. We hit a ceiling. And the way to go beyond that is revelation. Revelation teaches us that whatever we see from the world is supposed to be interpreted in a particular way. Make sense? You see everything around you, you see the cosmos around you, and you wonder to the purpose of it. Revelation teaches you that purpose. 
Which leads me to the last few questions that we have. Why would Allah punish a servant who does good but does not believe in it? First of all, anything I say right now or from now, like, okay, everything has been at least tangibly or somewhat connected to Quran and Hadith, but especially from now. So I'm not making anything up. When we look at the Quran and when we say, I believe in the Quran, when we testify to a creator, and not only a creator, we testify to a particular concept of a creator. Let me, tell, let me ask you something. I live in this world, I die, and there's nothing after that. Is that a model of belief? No, is that a model of belief? Is yes. that a particular concept of life? Yes. Yes. Okay. I live in this world, I will die, and I will be reincarnated into something else. Is that a model of belief? Yes. Okay. I live in this world, I believe in a particular creator, but don't prescribe to any particular code of living but I randomly believe in a creator. I die. Is that a mode of belief? Yes. yes. Okay. I live in this world. I believe in a particular code. I believe in a particular concept of the creator. I die. Is that a mode of belief? Yes. So, every person, whether they consciously, subconsciously, subconsciously or consciously subscribe to a religion, follows a particular code. You have somewhat of an idea of what you are doing here. Might not be a grand plan. You might not have all the steps figured out. But at the very least, you have some idea. Even if it's as basic as I am here, I will do whatever I want and I will die and that is it. That is still a particular concept of life. When a Muslim says... There's none worthy of worship but Allah. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. They are subscribing to a particular code of living. In that particular code, which is mentioned in the Quran, which is explained in the hadith, is what? Everything is connected to what and starts from what? Believing in Allah. Believing in Allah. So, if a person does not believe in Allah, let's start from that. If a person does not believe in Allah, according to the standard set in the Quran, Allah Himself says that that person's deeds will not be acceptable. Right? It's not something that we are interpreting to mean that way. It's something that is explicitly mentioned. There's nothing more clear than that. There is no room for argument in whether or not you have a choice in believing in Allah. You either do or you don't. If you don't, then my standards shouldn't be any worry to you. The standards of Islam only apply to a person who subscribes to the model set by Allah. It doesn't matter to anybody else. It's just another way of living. But for a person who chooses to subscribe to the model that Allah has set for us, it includes not only belief but also the outlook we are supposed to have of life. It also affects every single step of our life. It is not only that you believe in Allah and you do whatever you want. It is not only that you believe in Allah in any way you want. You have to believe it in a specific way. We don't only say Allah is the creator, we also say Allah is one, Allah has no partners, Allah is all powerful. Yes? Um, I don't know, I heard those hadiths where it says that Allah loves you at 10 or I don't know, I don't know the exact number. I'm, more than a mother does, right? Yes. So if my child 
does not believe in Islam. There's no way that I'm going to throw my child in a prison or torture him. Uh -huh. And hell is a pretty, pretty, you know, yeah. it's not like a prison. It's a hundred times worse. Okay. So why would God, who loves us like ten or, I don't know, ten number of times more than a brother does, do something like that? To a person who is a really good human being, but not a Muslim. Okay. Simply put, if Allah says that that's what he will do, then what can we say otherwise? But isn't that a contradiction? It might be a contradiction, and it does seem like a contradiction. But again, it is trying to understand something that we probably don't have all the answers to. This isn't just for your question in particular. If you look at a lot of things that when it comes to... I can't say theological matters, but it is an accepted fact that we don't have the answers to everything, right? 1400 years of scholarship, traditional scholarship, we don't have the answers to everything. It's not possible to have the answers to everything. We, at the very least, try our best to understand what we are in with the resources that we have been given. Now, if a person feels that that is something that does not seem like a law. My question is, what can a person do at that point? If you don't have answers, and this isn't just for your question, any question that you don't have answers to, again, all of it stems from the fact that you are choosing to believe in everything that Allah is telling you. Right down to the point that He is free to do as He wills with His creation. That falls under the purview of doing whatever he wants with his creation. Right? Now, your question of not wanting to punish his creation. But at the same time, Allah tells us in the Quran that you will be punished if you do certain things. Or he can choose to punish you if you do certain things. And if Allah tells us beforehand, and if a person is ch still chooses to ignore it, then is Allah free to do whatever He wishes? A lot of these questions are what you can term very circular. Because there will always be a question after that. Take a question, okay, this isn't mentioned any here. Concept of predestination. Allah knows the end result of every single person, so why try to do good? Allah already knows what I'm going to do. Why try? Right? You can come up with numerous arguments for it or against it. But it is a particular idea that even traditional scholars have said that at a certain point, you do what you just do, and you leave the rest up to Allah. But your, con your question does uh, come to, uh, hold on, which one is it? Hold on. Okay, the first question, uh, no, question number three that I told you, perhaps a non-Muslim is an overall decent human being, so why is it necessary to believe in Allah? Again, comes down to, comes down to, if you subscribe, to this particular mode of living, then you are getting everything in a package deal. Which includes the fact that doing good and being rewarded for it in the hereafter, not in this world, we're talking about the hereafter, is preconditioned on the fact that you have to believe in Allah. Now a person can choose not to believe in Allah and still do good. And for a person who is choosing to do so, is doing so because they feel that that is enough. For us, because of our outlook, because of how we view everything, that everything is preconditioned on believing in Allah first and foremost, we consider it to be necessary. If, as a human being, you feel that you are part of this divine cosmic plan, or you are a creation of an almighty, powerful human, uh, you know, not human, stuff, um, creator. And 
by virtue of being the creation of a being like that, he is at will to tell you to do whatever you want. And he is very capable and can legitimately demand from you what he wants. Which means everything that he sets forth is something that you should do. We're not supposed to. Yeah, that he's just commanding us or if you don't believe in him, he's just gonna throw us all in the I don't see I see him as, as the most merciful. But if a person believes in Allah to be merciful, he is still believing in Allah to have attributes of everything else as well. Our understanding or the Quranic understanding of Allah is balanced. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar Rahman Ar Rahim Maliki Yamiddin. First point of contact between creation and creator is Surah Fatiha. You pick up a book, you want to see what the book is about, you read the prologue. You want to see what the book is about. A person picks up the Quran, what's the first thing that they read? Surah Fatiha. It's the opening chapter of the Quran. Encapsulates, summarizes all the main points of the Quran. Which means, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen is the first verse spoken to human beings. If you look at it that way. What did Allah choose to say then? All praise is due to Allah who is the nurturer of the universes. Attribute number one, nurturing. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Beneficent, most merciful. Attributes number two and three. First three attributes Allah uses to introduce Himself is of mercy. But then what does Allah say? Maliki Yawmiddin. Master of the Day of Judgment. One day you will be standing in front of him and be questioned and be held accountable for everything that you did do, everything you did not do. The other side of it. But what did Allah mention more and what did Allah mention first? Mercy and the fact that his mercy is greater than his anger. But for a person to even get to that point, they have to start with the fact that Allah is their creator. Make sense? Now, for somebody who is outside the outlook of Islam, we'll say, it's not necessary. But we view it as necessary because we see that by virtue of being our creator, he can tell us to follow certain... Rules, yes, you had your hand up for a while, sorry. No, there is a specific a specific hadith that addresses the point of um, there was one somebody from the Quraysh who helped the Muslims out a lot that Aisha uh, asked Sayyidina Muhammad said so, um, what is going to be like his favorite and he said no she asked him why and so he said he does not one time in his life he would say what the favorite and you know when he entered Jannah he entered the Allah's mercy and how the Lord did yeah. So to say, like, somebody enters Jannah because of their good actions, that's not why we enter Jannah to begin with. We enter Jannah because Allah allows us into Jannah because He wants to, not because our good deeds um, compels Allah to enter us into Jannah. And also, there's the Hadith Qudsi which says, um, I am to my slave as he thinks of me. So if somebody does not even believe in Allah, that's their decision, and that's how Allah is going to. So their, their intention for doing good deeds is not to attain Allah's pleasure, but for some other reason, whether it's to feel good or to uh, get a nice car, to get a really nice job, then that's what their intention is for. Just like when we go to Hajj, and if you go to Hajj because your intention is to get married and not for Hajj, you're not going to get the song for Hajj, you know, and so you're going to get married, whatever. So like, intention still matters in this regard. If you're not doing it for the sake of Allah, then you didn't even believe in Jannah. So why should why why does Allah grant you a reward you didn't even believe in or you didn't even work towards? So part of the part of the concept of believing in Allah is also believing in the fact that we do things for Allah. That we don't do good because we just do it. We do it for a particular purpose because it is pleasing to Allah. Right? So, yeah. But hell is, I mean, heaven and hell, it's like two binary. It's not like a okay. spectrum, you know. It's not like, oh, heaven is all amazing, and then you have something in the middle, and then 
So, okay, so what will be the very base difference between both parties? Not, not with regards to what they did here. Not with regards to what they are being punished for or not with regards to what they are being rewarded for. What is the very base difference mentioned in the Quran between the two parties? Yes, between people who will go to either heaven or hell. What is the very base difference mentioned by Allah? If you have decided to come out, you're going to go to heaven Yeah. So, it's not about what is after. It is about what you start with. So, it comes down to the fact that if you acknowledge Allah as your creator, you acknowledge the fact that He knows what is best for you, and you acknowledge the fact that He wants what is best for His creation. You also acknowledge to the fact that he will tell you what to do which means when he tells you what to do you will subscribe to that which is the Quran if the Quran mentions certain things if it is up for interpretation we leave it at that yes um, so Jews and Christians will also go to heaven the Jews of the time of Musa alayhi salam are considered the Muslims of their time no because they also believe that if you believe in God and you believe in some way of thinking okay. you believe that if you are part of their religion mm -hmm. only you um, that's that's pretty much almost every major so, world religion. Exceptionalism, right? So, as a Muslim, part of your belief, which is included in the Quran, is the fact that the Quran is supposed to be a completion of every other book that was revealed before, of every other faith that came before, and nothing will be revealed after that, so people should subscribe to the Quran's beliefs. Right? But for a person who doesn't subscribe to the Qur'an, it doesn't make a difference to them. If they believe in something else, they will feel that they are on the right track. No other person but a Muslim will think that this is the only thing a person should believe in. It comes down to choosing how you want to view Allah. And if you feel that the words of Allah in the Qur'an are what Allah expects from us, that is what we have to follow. I'm not saying I have all the answers, trust me. <laughs> and this is, this is something that will come over and over. And these are questions that come over and over. And the fact is that it starts from a particular point of origin. Where does it start from? It starts from why is Allah doing so? Why is Allah doing so? Is there any way we can question Him? Or change His mind? I'm not being facetious, I'm being serious, right? If a person truly believes that they are completely subservient to Allah, intellectually, physically, emotionally, mentally, in every way, shape or form, they are subservient to Allah. Islam, at the end of the day, yes, it is derived from a word that means peace, but also means submission. Submission to the will of your Creator. Again, you will only submit if you subscribe to the will of the Creator. If a person doesn't believe in Islam, it's not for them. This is for us who have consciously chosen and are following a particular code of life. And when we are doing so, we are doing so with the idea that this is something that Allah has ruled for us. Right? Again, we can carry on. The second part of the question that, you, uh, that is related to yours is that why is it necessary? Perhaps the idea of God or religion doesn't cross their mind too often. Basically, why should you believe in Allah? Or why should you, why should you have to believe in Allah? And you know, why can't you just do good? What general approaches would you suggest in engaging such a person about the importance of the belief in Allah? The best, most sophisticated most intellectually pleasing arguments sometimes will not work. Sometimes the most simplest of actions, the most simplest of sentences will have the most profound effect. What does that show? That guidance is in the hands of Allah. Literally. That 
it is not up to us to convince every single individual of why it's important. Why it's important to believe in Allah. Why it's important to believe in a particular code. Right? We can try our best. We can give any, arg- any number of arguments. We can try to make any number of appeals rationally, emotionally. We can try our best. At the end of the day, if it makes sense to a person, if Allah chooses to give somebody guidance, it will make sense to them. No matter what you say. But it starts from that. If you believe yourself to be a creation of a creator, and you believe that creator has, in his, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, chosen for you to follow a certain way of life, that is what you will subscribe to. It starts from that. Should I follow commandments because Allah told me to, or because there's a logical and beneficial reason for it? Because Allah told you to. We might not understand the benefits or the rationale behind every action that we do. Think of one particular act of worship that all of us or most of us do every single year, which is the act of sacrifice, Qurban. What's the rationale behind it? Allah says it Himself, That when you are sacrificing an animal, the blood and the flesh don't go to Allah. You're the one who is making use of the animal. So what's the ultimate purpose of it? Allah asks you to worship Him in that particular way. You are following the practice of Ibrahim Does it make sense? No. We still do. When it comes to fasting, when it comes to fasting, fasting in summer days, 16 hour fast, does it make sense? You can make the argument, no, it doesn't make sense. Yet we still choose to do it. And when we say rationale, I don't mean virtues. You can't pull up a hadith and say, this is why we fast. That's why you are motivated to fast. It's not the actual rationale. Sometimes we just don't know or aren't told in clear-cut terms, this is why you should do it. The benefits of it, the wisdoms behind it. Why aren't Muslims allowed to do this? Why aren't we allowed to do that? We can try to come up with the best of explanations, but submitting to Allah includes intellectually submitting, which means sometimes the answers that we get will not be in, will not be intellectually gratifying. That answer that puts your heart at ease will not come every time. There will be questions, right? There will be certain instances where you will not be convinced, but you still put your trust in Allah and you move forward. So why is, why is uh, someone who does bad their entire life, yeah, and someone who does good, both hopefully, why are they ending up in the same place? It's the mercy of Allah. It's not up to us how we get into Jannah. Our entire point of doing good is through our good deeds we want to attract the mercy of Allah. We're not expected to be perfect. We weren't created to be perfect. What we try to do with our imperfect actions is we try to attract the mercy of Allah. And through the mercy of Allah we will be allowed entrance into Jannah. If a person does bad their entire life, and this is subjective, why? Because he did bad according to what you know. He could have been crying in the middle of the night to Allah and asking for forgiveness. But it was a trial for him to sort of just fall back in and out of whatever you kept on seeing. Right? On the day of judgment, Allah can choose to give him a higher rank than you based on that. And there's nobody on earth, no creation in existence that can make an argument against it. So it's Allah to do as He pleases. Right? Yeah. Um, so when I heard this is his question, I thought about it in another way. Um, and so like Allah tests everyone, of course, because uh, we're here and Allah tests us. So like we don't necessarily know how Allah tests a certain person. But... Um, 
Allah will show that Islam is the truth to everyone. Whether they accept it or not is on them. Yeah. <clears throat> so whether they choose, it's not like, oh, the thought comes up into your head, I'm going to start believing in Allah now. It's that you have a choice. It'll come up at some point in everyone's life where you will have the choice to believe in Allah and follow Islam or not. Yeah. So because of that, if you see a non-Muslim, you don't necessarily have to feel bad for them. It's like, oh, poor them, they're going to go to hell. It's they at some point will have a test from Allah to see whether or not they will accept. So, let's say you have somebody who was born a Christian, you have someone who was born a Muslim. Someone might think it's unfair that the person was born Muslim, they might have a better chance. But the way I've seen it is that's not the case, because how many people convert to Islam? How many people who are Muslim commit more sins than somebody who is a non-Muslim, or someone who converted, yeah. right? So that person who's a non, who, who's born in a Christian family, let's say, at some point in their life, Allah will show them Islam is the truth. And they'll be given the choice whether or not to accept Islam. And so it's at that point that that is going to be the differentiating factor between them and, the, and other people, whether they choose to accept, accept Islam or not. Allah is all merciful, but Allah is also all just. And so it's not like Allah still has to be Allah is still just, so it's not like His mercy is going to go free and like, it, it doesn't make sense because okay. not everyone, not non-Muslims and then Muslims who go to heaven, that's not fair. It's not fair to the people who work hard their whole life, do a lot of good deeds, refrain from a lot of bad, and then a non-Muslim or somebody who, who like does bad in life, they get to go to heaven too. It's not fair, right? People who do okay. good deeds in this life, they get rewarded in this life. And so... That's how Allah is merciful to them, also in this life. They, so, everyone will be tested and they'll have a choice whether to accept Islam or not. And so whether they choose it or not, that will differentiate them between other people. And then at that point, whether they choose Islam or whether or not, and, and this is one of the reasons why like, it's, a, it's a big deal. I mean, you have a choice whether to believe in Allah or not. So Allah will prompt that and so then you can. Yeah, also like, Allah guides because he knows what's in our hearts. Okay. He also knows what's in our hearts. So, you know, whatever outward appearance a person may have, or their actions outward, they can like see what's in their hearts and they can be different. You know, like we said earlier, an evil person can convince themselves you're doing something good. But, you know, in their minds you're doing something good, but what's in their heart is evil, it's making them think that what they're doing is good. You know, that's why Allah is a knower of, you know, everything. Can't even judge whether we ourselves are going to reject or reject. Um, because the reason for all of that is because Allah's love knows what's in the person's heart. So, like, when you say this person does good things, this person does bad things, even that, like, that doesn't matter at the end of the day because the only thing that matters is Allah's knowledge of that person, not our knowledge of that person. So, we can't even judge whether that person's worthy enough for Jannah or Jannah. Also, Jannah and Jannah. Jannah and Jannah. Allah's uh, creation, he thinks who's fit for that, for however he wants to. That's not comparable to anything in this world. Yeah, for us to compare it to anything in this world. It's not like prison or like this. You know, this is a completely different existence, reality, than our reality. It doesn't have to follow the same rules of what we can bear in this world. Yes? Um, I'm also wondering about We can't say so because we don't know how they will pass away. Because if a person accepts Iman and accepts the fact that Allah is the creator at the last moment, they will still be considered a Muslim. So there's no guarantee of how any of us are going to pass away. We can live Muslims our entire life and die a non-believer. Possible. And a person can be a non-believer their entire life and pass away a believer. So yes, not judging people based on life, based on what we see, uh, 
is something we should refrain from and we should continue to make dua for them and if a person passes away and there's no indication whatsoever of them having accepted then we can safely say that their judgment is up to Allah now. either way just like all of our judgments are up to Allah Not specific to your example, but isn't that for any level of atrocity that a person commits, whether against other people or against Allah? Because when we sin, we sin in different ways. We violate the rights of either the human beings around us in numerous ways, in numerous degrees, or we violate the rights of Allah. Comparatively, which one is worse? Because Allah will not forgive the violation of the rights of another person because it is not his rights that you violate. Right? But if you compare the rights of Allah to the rights of the creation, which one is worse in terms of violating? Rights of Allah. So if a person violated the rights of Allah his entire life, did not violate the rights of any human being, only Allah passes away, 
Allah chooses to punish him and eventually enters him into Jannah. There's nothing we can say against it. Right? If a person violates the rights of another human being as heinously as possible in this world, and Allah chooses to punish them as long as possible, as long as He wishes, if at the end of the day, He still chooses to enter them into Jannah based on saying, La ilaha illallah, which is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ as well, can any of us say anything against it? No, right? Yes, no. I think one thing all of us, and this isn't specific to your example again, I think this is with regards to what we would consider fair. When we think of the concept of justice and mercy, we are thinking of it in terms of what we think is just and merciful, right? What is fair is according to what we think is fair. If as a creator, as an all-powerful creator, if he chooses to say that this is how you should live, somebody does not follow it and gets punished as a result, according to that, is it fair or not? It's fair. But according to us, on the ground level looking up, when we look at it, we say, well, you are infinitely merciful, why are you still punishing your creation? Aren't you as merciful or more merciful than a mother for her child? Right? So, one is what we deem to be fair, and one is the boundaries of fairness that Allah has laid down in the Qur'an. Anything beyond that, in His infinite wisdom and mercy, He chooses to deem it unfair. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that's the definitive answer, but that's how I'm looking at it. That when we think of certain things of why would Allah do this? Or is it fair of Allah to do so? We are thinking of it in terms of what we deem to be fair and not looking at it or even, you know, attempting to hypothetically look through the perspective of a being like Allah. So as a human being, uh, insignificant, weak creation living on this earth, if my rights are violated by somebody else, and I, in my limited capacity, can deem that to have been wronged to me, why can't Allah, in His capacity, choose to say that if you do not believe in me, then that is a wrong against me? We'll leave it at that. So, inshallah, uh, I know these questions will come up because many of the questions have these issues at its core. Uh, so, we'll discuss it more, inshallah. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, subhanakallah, alhamdulillah. Shadu wa la ilaha illallah, astaghfirullah, wa